Morning everyone. Morning. Morning. Who's got a hangover? Uh, uh, yeah. I've got that shift. I've got to G you up for the day. Get you motivated. Get you motivated. So, title of my talk is Accelerating Your Bushcraft Learning. And the premise of the talk really is on the one hand, we have quite a few bushcraft and survival experts saying this stuff takes a lifetime to learn. I've been studying it since I was two. I was raised by wolves. I still don't know everything. And on the other hand, you have a lot of people who are interested in bushcraft skills. They want to learn bushcraft skills. They want to apply bushcraft skills. But you've got a full-time job. You've got kids. You've got responsibilities, you've got other interests. So how do you marry those two things together? How do, you, how do you get good at something that takes a lifetime to learn when you haven't got a lifetime to do it? That's kind of where I'm coming from. How do you get up the curve, to use a cliche, how do you get up that learning curve quicker? So there's going to be some random questions in the middle of this, and hopefully it all comes together. I don't want you to shout out the answer to this. Just have a think about it while half, still half listening to what I'm going to say in a, in a second. Have a think about the answer to this question. How many words are there in the English language? Just have a number in your head in the next few minutes. How many words are in the Oxford English Dictionary? How many words? Second question for you. Who has absolutely no idea who I am? Be honest. This guy. Superb. Good. That's less than normal. I'm doing well. Okay, so for the benefit of this chap here, um, my name is Paul Kirtley. Um, you can find out more about me on my blog, paulkirtley.co.uk. There's lots of stuff there, lots of information there that will be useful to you. All of it is, is free. Um, I've been teaching bushcraft full time for quite a long time. Um, I've had my own company, Frontier Bushcraft, that started that, we're in our seventh year, started that in 2010. Before that, I was full-time course director at Woodlaw Limited, Ray Mears Company. And before that, I was part-time. So I've been involved in teaching bushcraft for the best part of 15 years, and most of that full-time. So I've got some thoughts on how to teach this subject and how to get people to a competent level as quickly as possible. And that's some of that I want to share with you. And also my own journey of how did I get up the curve? How did I learn things? How did I get in a position where I was able to stand in front of people, demonstrate things, teach things, and talk to you today? So has anybody got Id any idea who this fellow is? I told you there'd be some random questions. Random questions. OK, this fellow was an Italian, Vilfredo Perito, and there's a photograph of him. And he came up with what's known as the Perito Principle. In 1906, he was looking at the division of wealth, the inequality of wealth in Italy. It's not a new subject, it's part of the election, our election debate at the moment, the inequality in society. And Perito was looking at how wealth is distributed and one thing he noticed was that 20% of the population in Italy owned 80% of the land. He also noticed, he was a keen gardener, which we can all appreciate, he liked plants, he liked nature, he noticed that 80% of the peas that his garden produced came from 20% of the pods. And he thought, hmm, this is interesting. And he did some more study, and it's that that has become better known as the 80-20 principle. And it's worth understanding that they're two separate sets. It's 80% of one thing and 20% of another thing. So you could have 95 and 5, you could have 80 and 17. They don't have to add up to 100. That's the important thing. But the important thing to understand is the relationship isn't linear. Yeah? 20% of the people own 80% of the land. 20% of the pea pods, 80%. So the, the other 20% is made up by the other 80%. It's not a straight line, it's not proportional. 
Another non secretaire random question who's read this book? Come on, be honest. Who's read it recently? <laughs> Excellent, good. And how about this one? Less popular, maybe? Anybody read this one? Excellent, good. I'll come back to that. Who knows who this fellow is? Come on, it's early. Give me something. Excellent. Bruce. And can anybody remember the game show that he was presenting there, the clues in the photo? Vince? Uh, play your cards right. Play, play your cards was it play your cards right? Anybody agree with that? Excellent. Good. And what was his catchphrase? What did, what did he ask? What was the question he asked? Higher or lower? Higher or lower? So we're going to play that game a little bit. How many words in English? I'm going to, I'm going to say 75,000. Lower? Higher. Come on, shout. Lower? Higher? 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 higher. higher. Okay. There are, in the Oxford English Dictionary, the 20 volume Oxford English Dictionary, there are 171,476 words. In Spanish, there are 100,000 plus words. And in French, there's also 100,000 plus words. So, question is, how many words do we need to actually, how, do, how many words do we need? Uh, do we all know 171,000 words? And that's not including the obsolete words, the historically used words that we don't really use. There's another about, about 50,000 of those. So how many words do we actually need? How many words do you actually need to learn Spanish? Anybody here speak Spanish? Conversationally, one person, or two, per two people. What about French? Maybe more people speak French, a few more people. Most people here, I'd imagine, are British then, given there's about three people in the room who can speak a foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> so how many words do I need? Well, the answer is actually to be perceived as conversationally fluent, you need between 2,000 and 3,000 words of vocabulary. I'm not talking about grammar, just talking about vocab. So in languages where there's over 100,000 words, if you know two to 3,000 of them, you're perceived as conversationally fluent. And if you make a list of the words in English, ranked by how often they're used in, in say, in common writing, the most common word, can everybody see that? The most common word is the, which isn't that surprising, I guess. Second most common is of, and the third most common is and, and so on and so forth. And there's a list there of the first hundred. And if you actually look at how often they're used, so that is the most frequently used word. 7% of written language in general uses, so newspapers, blogs, General, general books that you might read, so not specialist text. 7% yeah, is the. 3.5% is of. 2.7% and. So if you knew those three words, just three words, and you picked up a piece of English writing, you'd know 13% of the words on average. So you'd, know, you'd have 13% comprehension of the actual words on the page if you just knew three. And you can chart that. Yeah, you get more bang for your buck early on. So you, you, you learn the most frequent words first, you get an increase in comprehension. As you learn the less frequently used ones, the incremental increase in comprehension is less. So, Dr. Zeus, how many words do you think are in that book? Go on, pause it a guess. 50? Higher or lower? Ooh, we've got lower, most people are higher. 236. I think I know where the 50's coming from. Green eggs and ham. Now, Dr. Zeus wrote Cat in the Hat, and he used 236 words, and then he had a bet with his publisher that he couldn't write a similar book and a similarly popular book with fewer words, and they bet 50. 
And so it has 50 words. It only has 50 different words in that book. And if you don't believe me, those are the words. That's the only words. So if you know those 50 words, you can understand everything in that book. So, everyday writing. If you know the first 25 most used words, you'll understand 33% of everything that's written on average. First 100 words, 50%. 1,000 words, 89%, and first 3,000 words, 95%. And this is where that 2,000 to 3,000 comes from. If you learn the most used words first, you get up that curve more quickly. You become conversationally fluent more rapidly. And if you could learn 100 to 200 words a day, you could become conversationally fluent in a language within two, three, four weeks. Surprising, it's not going to take a lifetime if you learn the right stuff first. So what on earth has this got to do with bushcraft? Those of you that didn't think you had a hangover maybe are thinking, maybe I do have a hangover. This guy's making no sense whatsoever. Okay, the not Bible. It is Sunday after all in the Church of Bushcraft. And we have the Knot Bible. This is the Ashley Book of Knots. Does anybody own this book? Go and find it if you're a knot nerd. It has over 3,800 knots in it. That's enough to send people who have knot phobia into some sort of fit. You know, you have people who go, I don't know any knots, I can't do knots. 3,800 knots. Do you need to know 3,800 knots to get by in life? No. And that's kind of the point. So how many knots do you need to know? Well, I would posit 10 to 50, depending on what you do. Yeah? 10 knots. I've written a list, and I, I, I talked about it a lot last year. Watch my presentation from last year. It's online. But I offered this suggestion of skills that are a good baseline of bushcraft skills, outdoor skills to have. And in that I made some lists. And I suggested that as, if you needed to know 10 knots, these were a useful, useful selection for most things that you need to do. Okay, we're not including specialist tarp knots and prussics and things, but just to get by, there are 10 knots there that will get you by in a lot of situations, including some climbing situations, Mountain leader syllabus these days contains the overhand knot. That's it. There's no bowlins or anything in there anymore. Just one knot applied in different ways. So, coming on to the heart of bushcraft. Knots are important. I would suggest knots are part of bushcraft. We all tie tarps, hammocks, tie things into our canoes, tie things onto sleds, tie things on, hanging things up from trees, whatever it is, we need some knots. But at the heart of bushcraft, is a knowledge of nature and I'm happy to argue that until the cows come home. It's not about shiny knives, it's not about canvas. Those things are nice to have but they're equipment choices. At the heart of the skill set is a knowledge of nature, a practical knowledge of nature. How do I use the resources that are out there? So let's consider trees and we'll apply Pareto a little bit. So let's ask the question, what proportion of species do we need to know in order to achieve what we want to achieve in our outdoor life, in our bushcraft life, in applying our bushcraft skills? What tree species do we need to know? So we can kind of think about the world in this way. What do we need to know? What would be nice to know? And what do we just not need to know at all? And that might seem a bit dismissive, but you can learn that if you want, but what do I need to know to do the things that I want to do most of the time? How many words do I need to know to have a conversation with some person in a Spanish bar when I'm on holiday? It's not all of them. So consider learning 100 trees versus learning 25 trees. You are not necessarily going to quadruple the number of tinders that you know by learning an extra 75 trees. You are not necessarily going to learn the number of, di quadruple the number of barks that you know you can make containers out of by quadrupling the number of trees that you know. 
If you learn the right 25 trees first, you've got more utility, you've got more ability than learning the least useful 25 trees first. It's the same as with learning the right words first. To become fluent in bushcraft, if you learn the right words first, if you learn the right trees first, that's the analogy in this case, but we can apply it to plants, fungi. So get the biggest bang for your buck from those first few. So how do we get there? How do we get to that list? How do we get to the 25 we should learn first? Well, by asking the right questions is how we do it. Asking the right questions. So we can ask the question, which species are most widespread? Here's a map. Can everybody see that? I can't see what you can see. Yeah, this is a distribution map. So it's the world laid out flat, as you generally see it in an atlas of the world. And the green is a distribution of a plant. It's actually a, a woody plant. So by woody plant, we mean shrubs and trees. And this is the most widespread woody plant. Who would like to hazard a guess as to what it is? Juniper, yes. It's juniper, well done. The most widespread woody plant, not just in the Northern Hemisphere, but generally is the most widely distributed woody plant on planet Earth is juniper. How many people here, other than drinking gin, maybe last night, how many people here, other than drinking gin, have ever used juniper for any thing in bushcraft? Andrew. So this is my point. The most widely distributed plant that does have bushcraft uses, virtually nobody here has ever used it. So you're learning the wrong words first. So these are the juniper berries, used for flavouring in gin, very good in stews, but it's also very good for friction fire lighting. The bark is good for tinder, makes a good bird's nest tinder bundle. The wood can be used for friction, hand drill hearths, bow drill parts, works very well. And it's the most widely distributed plant on the planet. And then if we start looking at other widely distributed species, it shouldn't be a great surprise, silver birch in Western Europe and Scandinavia, that's the distribution there, widely distributed. And looking more widely at Eurasia, silver birch through Eastern Europe all the way to Sakhalin and Kamchatka on the east of Russia. Yeah, very widely distributed. Similar species, paper birch through North America. The birch that birch bark canoes were made from. And you can see why, look at the overlap of distribution of that species with canoe country. Classic canoe country, Canadian Shield from Hudson's Bay down to the Great Lakes and beyond that is where the birch bark canoe was born that's the distribution of paper birch so there we look at most widely distributed we're going to get some very very useful trees in a roundabout way well we're going to ask which are the most common because they might be widely distributed but there might not be many of them in a particular place you might, you might have to go quite away in an area to find one. So what we're also interested in, what's most common? But again, asking that question, we come up with some similar answers. We're going to come up with some different answers as well. We're going to come up with some similar answers. And one of them is birch. Where you get one birch, you typically get many birch. You don't tend to, to find them just on their own. Whereas yew trees, for example, if you know any woodlands with yew tree, you might get a few clustered together, but they tend to be isolated stands. Forests of northern Scandinavia, lots of Norway spruce, lots of Scots pine, the occasional rowan. There aren't many, you don't get stands of them, mountain ash. But birch, you get a lot together. Same in North America, the North American species, you get a lot together. So they're widespread, but they're also common where they do occur. That's another tick of, that should be quite high up our list. Another question to ask, and not just about trees, but whatever you want to be able to do, what's the most useful species to know? Like, if I want to do friction fire lighting, things like oak and hornbeam are not useful to know, because they're just too hard. There are other species which are more useful to know. 
So silver birch comes up again as being very useful. Uses for silver birch. Go on, shout some out. Bit of audience participation. Starting a fire. How might we start a fire with silver birch? Scraping the bark. Dropping a, dropping a spark onto it. Excellent. How else? Making pots. Making containers. Yeah. We can make containers with birch. How else might we light a fire with it? What else can we use in fire lighting? Birch sap for fire lighting? You can drink that. You can make wine out of it. It's hard to set fire to it. Whereas other you know, resinous saps, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Birch tar, you can make birch tar. Yeah. How else, might, how else can we use birch in fire lighting? Burn it. Burn, burn it, yes. <laughs> Which bits? It is early, isn't it? <laughs> kindling, which bit? The, twigs. the small twigs for kindling, excellent. What else, sorry? The rest, of the, tree. the rest of the tree, yeah, you can use it. Could we do friction fire lighting with birch? Yeah, you can, it's not the best, but it does work. What else could we use silver birch for? Yeah, you can, you can use bindings, you, you can kind of withy them up, they're not the best withies, but you can. Which other part could we use for cordage or bindings? Roots. Roots can be used for bindings. So you are learning some bushcraft stuff today. What else can we use birch for? Washing. Who said washing? Which bit? The leaves, they've got sap in, in the leaves, we can use them for washing. So, fire, carving, nobody said carving. A lot of Swedish handicrafts, kosas, cooksers, whatever you want to call them, spoons, lots of stuff made out of birch. Soap from the leaves. Sap can be used, can be drunk, can be used to make other things. Tar, dry distillation of the bark, Russian oil. Containers, baskets, baskets can be made, whether it's woven baskets, so strips of bark woven together, or whether it's solid sheets of bark stitched together with roots. And footwear even has been made out of birch bark. Again, using that sort of woven basket principle. You can make quivers for arrows from woven birch strips of birch bark. You can make sheaths for knives. Lots and lots. So this is a tree that a lot of people consider a weed. Highly, highly useful. Scots Pines, another similar one. Fire, it has many uses. From fine kindling, through to friction fire, through to using the resins. Vitamin C, pine needle tea, it's rich in vitamin C. And the further north we go, where it's colder, it's richer in vitamin C. The inner bark can be used, dried, ground, used as a flower substitute. The Finns who fought the Russians in the uh, winter war that happened just before the Second World War on the Finnish-Russian border, augmented their flower rations by using the inner bark of Scots pine to bulk out the flour for making their bread. One of the reasons why they were so effective. Resin, again. Cordage, roots for bindings. And then it also throws up other species as we look wider. Eastern white cedar, for example, on the eastern part of the United States and into southeastern Canada. Cordage, fibrous outer bark. Fire, and there's lots of uses, fibrous outer bark for tinder. Friction, very good friction fire lighting wood. Feather sticks, very nice fine grain, straight grain, nice to carve, makes beautiful feather sticks. Baskets can be used can be made from the, the woven bark, but also the wood can be split so finely that baskets can be made. Matting can be made from the tree as well, from the bark. There are also those fine cedar canoe ribs that get put in birch bark canoes, and even cedar strip canoes, cedar canvas canoes rather. And medicinal uses, again, rich in vitamin C. One of the other names for the cedars, eastern white cedar, rest and wed cedar, is arbor vitae, the tree of life. Lots of medicinal uses, and in particular, rich in vitamin C. And there were certainly some European sailors who didn't die of scurvy because natives 
gave them cedar tea to drink and they warded off, prevented the further deterioration due to scurvy. So we can ask these questions, what's widespread? Juniper, birch, what's common where it occurs? And what's useful? And if we intersect those questions, we come up with those, those words, if you like, that you should learn first to get the fluency. And you, so which species do we learn first to get the fluency that we can do as many things as we possibly can? So that's species, but what about skills? What should we learn first? Which skills? Again, what do you want to be able to do? Start with the answer. Think about the results. We don't all want the same things from our outdoor life. We've got different aspirations. We want to be able to do different things. Some people want to make tough journeys. Some people want to be super comfortable in overnight camps. Some people want to make a birch bark canoe. Other people have got no interest in that, but they might want to carve loads and loads of cups and spoons that some people might want to make baskets. What do you want to be able to do? Or do you want to be able to do all of those things? But asking what you want to do then makes you ask the right questions otherwise. And again, there's that skills list there that you can download. One thing I would say that you should do, I used to teach jiu-jitsu, I used to teach martial arts for a while. And I studied it for a long time. And what you notice with people, particularly guys, they come in, they want to get a belt. I want to do a grading, get a yellow belt. So they come in and they, you, you teach them the basics and they go for their yellow belt grading after three or six months and they get their yellow belt and they come back and then they want to get their orange belt and they come back and they train and they do their orange belt maybe three or six months later. But if you, if you rush at that, if you, if you don't consolidate those basics, when they get to purple, blue belt, brown belt, if the basics aren't solid, you have to kind of spend remedial time because if you keep trying to rush through everything, and the reason the basics are the basics is because they form the foundation. They form that basis on which you build everything else. So it's the same with bushcraft. A lot of people want to rush to more complicated things. They want to rush to more advanced things, but it's the basics that are solid that will, will help. And if you're, if you're slow and inefficient with the basics, you don't have as much time to spend on the more advanced stuff ultimately. So I would say obsess yeah, with the basics. Yeah, there's an increasing amount of people sharing on social media, and I'm, I'm not judging that at all. I share stuff on social media. But what that does allow is a window into people's worlds and a window into people's capabilities and a window into where they're at with their skills. And what I see a lot of is really bad feather sticks, for example. Really, really bad. Yeah. And it's normally to try and post a picture of some new knife they've got. Oh, I've got this new knife. I'll carve a few curls. Oh, I made a feather stick. Nice knife. Yeah, and I am being sarcastic. I am t taking a mickey. Because what's important is not the knife. The important thing is the skill. Yeah, if, if you're really interested in bushcraft, yeah, the important thing is the skill. Yeah, so obsess on it. Obsess about it. Yeah, the people that I've known that have got best who are the most competent in bushcraft, whether it's Ray Mears, who you'll hear from later today, people that have worked for me, people that I've worked with, they've got one thing in common, is that they obsess about skills. They don't just go, yeah, I've done that, I've got that, I've mastered that, on to the next, yeah, okay, bow drill, I've done it with one wood once, right, I've mastered that, I'm going to move it, oh, hand drill, yeah, I did it once without getting blisters, I've mastered that, right, yeah, I've done a bit of cordage with line bark, yeah, that's not how you get good at this stuff. You get good at this stuff by doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And focusing on the most important things. So identify the most important things, those important 2,000 to 3,000 words, if you like, rather than the 171,000 words. Rather than trying to learn the whole Oxford English Dictionary badly, 
learn the most important things for you, for what you want to do, and obsessively get good at them. Ray Goodwin, who will be talking on the stage tomorrow morning, is the same with canoeing. He's an obsessive little man. Yeah? And I say that with the greatest warmth in my heart. Yeah? That's why he's such a great canoeing technician. That's why he's technically so good in a boat. He's like Yoda. Yeah? You, you look at it and you go, how can you be good at paddling? And then you see him on the water. Yeah? It's the same with Yoda when he's just hobbling along and then he fights, what's his name? Um, Christopher Lee. Yeah? So obsess about the skill set. Don't just do it superficially. Obsess about it. Deconstruct it. Own it. Understand why it works. Look outside of yourself. Don't just be satisfied with creating a few crappy curls. Look at what the best people are able to do and set that as your standard. Don't make excuses as to why you can't, why they can do it and you can't do it. Yeah. Be obsessive and focus on it. That if there's one piece of advice, identify the most important things to learn and then obsessively work on them so you get good at them. It's the same as the, the Oso Tagari and the break falling and the basic jiu-jitsu and judo techniques. Get really good at them. If you look at really high level judo players in the Olympics, they've normally got one technique which they're really, really, really good at and that's their secret weapon. Because yeah, they're obsessed on that thing. Look at somebody like Neil Adams for example. Look at a lot of people who are very, very good. They've got one killer skill. Like really high performing people, they've got one thing that they're really obsessed over. Yeah, get really good at stuff. Don't try and do everything quickly. Focus on the things that are important, do it well. And then you've got the concept of training versus maintenance. Okay, anybody here ever done any weight training? Yeah, okay. Generally, what, to, to, to put muscle on, you need to do a certain amount of training, but to keep it on, you don't need to do as much training. You just need to keep it ticking over. It's the same with cardiovascular fitness. You've got to focus on it to, to train it, but then you can keep it by, by, by maintaining it, doing it regularly enough, but not necessarily at the same training intensity. And it's the same with these skills. Don't try and do a bit of this, a bit of that, be a sort of grasshopper, a butterfly, a bushcraft butterfly where you're flitting around from one flower to the next, doing a bit of hand drill, doing a bit of cordage, doing a bit of this, doing a bit of that, a bit of natural nav. Yeah? Just focus on one area. Get good at that. That's your training phase. And then, when you've got to a good level in that, go on to the next thing. Maintain that skill. Go into maintenance mode on the thing you've obsessed about for a while and focus on that. And again, here's an application of the 80-20 principle of Pareto. Yeah, spend 80% of the time, if you like, on the thing that you want to get much better at and 20% of the time maintaining the other stuff. That's how you will improve quickly. And then keep doing that rather than spending 5% of the time on everything and being crap at everything. Yeah, that's the way to, to move up the curve. Keep it simple though. I enjoy walking around events like this because you see all sorts of weird and wonderful tarp setups. Yeah, there are all sorts of macrame setups and lines and what have you. Just one example, pot hangers. People overcomplicate things. Search for the novel. Novelty is, again, so social media might be partly responsible. What thing can I post today that somebody else hasn't posted? I'll find something different to post. There's this search for novelty. I think we tend to do it in life in general, don't we? New iPhones come out, new Samsungs come out, new Canon cameras come out, new Nikon cameras come out, Nike have just put some new trainers out, limited edition that. We, we're always seeking the novel, but the problem is if you're constantly trying to do things in new and different ways within bushcraft, it doesn't necessarily help you. There are tried and tested ways of doing things. And also, keep it simple, stupid. And that's not a new concept. 
Yeah? Thomas Aquinas wrote many, many years ago. If a thing can be done adequately by means of one, it is superfluous to do it by means of several. For we observe that nature does not employ two instruments where one suffices. Yeah? So keep it simple, stupid, is what he was saying. Don't overcomplicate stuff. Nature doesn't overcomplicate stuff. We shouldn't overcomplicate stuff either. And I think that applies particularly to bushcraft. At some point, you might want to find a mentor. I haven't talked about anybody teaching you this stuff at any point. I've just talked about you working on your skills. But at some point, finding a mentor can be helpful. Whether it's carving, making canoe paddles, making canoes, outdoor cookery, tracking, natural nav. You might want to find somebody who can help you, who can answer your questions, because yes, you can figure a lot of this stuff out yourself. But Isaac Newton was famous for saying, he may have seen further than other people, but it was because he stood on the shoulders of giants. Yeah? And it's kind of the same thing for you guys. This knowledge is already out there. The skill set's already out there. How to do these things is already out there. And yes, you can fumble along and, and learn on your own. And I think there's great value in terms of owning the skills in experimenting yourself. There's nothing wrong with you saying, right, I'm going to try lots of different materials for feather sticks, or I'm going to try lots of different materials for bow drill, and doing that on your own time. But do that once you've got the basics right. And what you want to do, where a mentor might be useful, is you may have self-taught bow drill, but then you might want to check with somebody who's seen a lot of other people so one of the reasons I'm effective as a teacher, and that's what I consider myself, I don't consider myself a, a, a blogger or a writer or an expert or any of these labels that get applied to me. I'm a teacher, that's what I do, I teach people. I teach people in person and I teach people remotely by sharing articles in Bushcraft and Survival Skills magazine, on my blog, YouTube videos, try and help people with their, with their bushcraft journey. And the reason I'm effective in helping people, even at a distance, is because I've seen enough different people trying to learn different skills. And I, I, I see commonalities, I see common failure points, and I see common things that I can tweak that will make a step change in your success rate. And again, I think about bow drill. Yeah, somebody can send me a video from Canada of them doing bow drill and I can say, move your foot closer to the spindle, lock your wrist to your shin, use the full length of the string, stop moving the bow up and down, which means more flex at your elbow, just by watching that video. They can go and do it and they'll have more success. But the only reason I can make those observations is I've, because I've had enough students over the years to see all those things and to make those tweaks. The same with Ray Goodwin, if he takes you on the water, he can look at your J stroke and say, okay, make these changes. Do this, you're doing a short J, a long J, you're not rotating your wrist enough, get the blade vertical, whatever it is, the blade's not in the water. Yet you're leaving it in too long, you're not doing enough on the power stroke, whatever it is. That's because of the experience of teaching. And that's the value of a mentor, somebody who can help you make those step changes rather than you coming across them by chance. And then when you've got that technique good, then experiment with lots of different materials and make that skill your own. So, also I would say make journeys. And I don't mean that you have to go walking in the Hindu, Hindu Kush for a year. What I mean is go and apply the skills at some point. Even if it's an overnighter, yeah? It's all well and good sitting in the woods practicing your bow drill or practicing your feather sticks or practicing your tarp setups or thinking about your natural navigation skills, but take the opportunity, it might be a little bit contrived, but take the opportunity to go and apply it. Go and plan a little journey. It could just be a weekend. Set off on a Saturday morning, go for a hike, hike until an hour before sunset, set up, apply everything that you want to apply, get up and move on. Because you have to then do things efficiently. Maybe you decide you want to light your fire with bow drill and you haven't collected any of the materials and you have to collect them along the way while you're doing your hike. Apply, make journeys. Making journeys makes you efficient. Making journey makes you efficient with your skills, it makes you efficient with your admin, 
makes you be able to do things in real time rather than kind of training time, bit of pressure, maybe it's raining, maybe you're cold, maybe you're hungry, maybe you're irritated with your mate because he's going slow, whatever it is, it puts it into a real context. And for me, making journeys, whether it's hiking trips in the UK, canoe trips in the UK, canoe trips in Canada, snowshoeing trips in the Arctic forest, that's what really hones my skills. I'll do another axe demo tomorrow. I did one yesterday. I'll do an axe demo down at our stall at Frontier. The reason I got good at those skills is not because I taught many, many bushcraft courses teaching those skills. The thing that got me good at those skills was making journeys in the northern forests in winter where I had to be efficient with my axe skills because we needed them every single day. Now, so look at what interests you, what piques your interest. Identify the skills and knowledge that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck in those areas. Find a mentor if you need to, to help you get the technique right. Apply that as much as possible, practice it as much as possible, make that skill your own and make journeys. Again, not a new concept, making journeys. Okay, now I'm going to apply the 80-20 principle a little bit by finishing early. Yeah, giving you more time. Yeah, I've, I've told you everything I need to tell you. I don't need to tell you anything more. There's no point me waffling on for another 15 minutes or 10 minutes. But I do have some time for questions. I am doing a live Ask Paul Kirtley tomorrow for general questions. So I'll do a live, all comers, answer anything if I can. I'll point you in the right direction, the right resources tomorrow. But in terms of this presentation, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yes, yes. So the question is, how do I feel about 10,000 hours to become an, an expert? Yeah, I think that has a place, particularly with physical skills. I think there's some, there's some place for that. And I, I, that's where I'm at with that focusing, that obsessing part. Yeah, you aren't going to, yes, you can have a go at something, but to get really good at something, you've got to do that repetition. Yeah, we shy away from repetition and memorization these days, but repetition in, in, in learning, repetition in physical skills is important. But practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. You have to be doing the right thing repeatedly to, to, for it to be good. If you're just ingraining the wrong thing, it doesn't get you much further. So again, going back to that point about getting some external input, particularly on physical skills, particularly on things that require some technique. Get some, get, if you can get some external input along the way, because that will maybe shortcut some of those hours of, of, of frustration. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, it's a little bit of a, a cute thing for me to say that you understand 13%. I would be more technically correct to say you recognize 13% of the words on the page. Yeah, absolutely. Understanding is about context. Understanding is about nuance. Understanding is about the combination of words. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's the same with bushcraft. You can understand the individual pieces. But I think with any skill, and we can go back to the martial arts as, as well, um, any, any physical skill until you kind of get to an intermediate level where you can start applying things in different combinations, that's where the real learning and, and um, assimilation of the skill starts. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, it's a little bit trite for me to say you've got 13% understanding, 13% of recognition, recognizing 13% of the words. I mean, think about learning Chinese, for example. That might be a better example. You don't want to do that, no. But again, it's a similar thing. If you want to read a, 
a, a, a Chinese newspaper, they reckon you need to know 3,000 characters. That's what's, uh, and I know no Chinese. But, and so I could look at a Chinese text and understand none of it. But the same principle would apply if you, the, the five most commonly used kanji, if you learned those, you would recognize them. You wouldn't necessarily know what it meant, but you'd recognize them. And so you're still fumbling around in the dark to a certain extent, but the more of them you learn, the more then you can start seeing the stitch together. So, and I would say it's the same with bushcraft. Yeah, you can learn the individual techniques, but going out and applying them, getting to that intermediate stage where you're starting to be able to improvise and combine things in different ways to, to other, other than what you've been shown as do this, do this, do this. Well, it's like, well, I could use this and that. I've not used these two things together before. That's when you really start to own the skills. But that's what you, you need those. Again, it's like the yellow belts wanting to be brown belts. You've got to put those basics in place in the first place. One more question, if we've got another question. Well, that is me. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate that very, very much. Um, if you've got any further questions, come and see me down at Frontier. We've got some good stuff going down there. I'm doing an axe demo tomorrow morning again. Um, or is it tomorrow afternoon? Sometime tomorrow. Have a look at the schedule. I'm also doing a live Ask Paul Kirtley here tomorrow morning. So thanks for your attention. I appreciate you being here early on a Sunday, particularly those of you that have come for the day. It's much appreciated. And thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good one. Take care.